The topic we're going to discuss now is called linear programming. It is perhaps my favorite topic of the entire course. I do a lot of this in my research and just kind of fun daily kind of life. Yeah, I know, kind of boring to you guys maybe, but to me this stuff is interesting and fun. Plus I get to use um, lots of nice software and all that fun stuff to do it too. So here what we're talking about, we're not talking about programming in the sense of computer programming, but we're talking a program comes out. And here the term program comes from the from the 40s when this stuff was invented, 1940s. Um, it's a course of action, a prescription for what is going to be done or should be done or is a recommendation if you want to think of it that way. And the linear stuff comes from all of the equations and or inequalities in the mathematical model have to be linear. And so we'll go through the different assumptions in class about what it means for a linear program. There are four big ones, uh, and we'll talk about those in, in class. But what I want to talk about a little bit today is how to actually go about formulating. Formulating and then solving are two different steps. If you can't formulate the problem, then you will not be able to solve it. So for formulation, I suggest uh, maybe a pattern such as this, which is read the problem. I know that sounds kind of silly and simple, but, you know, just read the whole thing, the whole thing, so the whole problem, once, just to kind of get a general idea. Step two... Read it again. This time, I'm going to look for very specific things. I'm going to look for. Uh, I'm going to look for what my objective is. For us, that's going to be a lot of times maximize profit or maximize revenue. It could be minimize cost or minimize time. I'm going to think about what my decision variables are. A decision variable is an abstract con concept but it is basically anything that the decision maker has control over. So if I'm doing a product mix problem, I'm, I'm a company that makes five different types of products. My decision variables would be I'd have one decision variable for each type of product I make and the question would be how many of each other one of those five products should I produce in order to maximize revenue, for example. So I look for decision variables and then look for constraints. These are the things that are limiting me from becoming the richest man in the world. So I obviously have a lot of constraints because I'm not the richest man in the world. And then the last thing we're going to be looking for is data. These will be the numbers, the coefficients that go on the equations for a linear program. And then I would say the next thing would be step three, formulate the problem. Now this takes practice. Plain and simple. It's the only way you're going to get good at it is to practice, practice, practice. So there is some art to it as much as there is science when you're formulating it. And many problems can be formulated multiple ways to, in order to give you the same type of answer. Some formulations are more elegant than others. Some are better in order to be put into software or a solver to solve them. We're not going to get so much into that. We're going to try to stick to stuff that's a little bit simpler and is relatively straightforward to formulate. So to formulate the problem, because we have the stuff from the second step that we just looked at, I want you to take a very I want you to take this approach where we're going to first say let we're going to define the decision variables. So we're going to let uh, let's say we are doing, um, we're a toy company, we're making toy soldiers and toy trains, right? 
So let s equal the number of toy soldiers to produce or make. T number of toy trains to produce. And a lot of times I'll go ahead and define a variable called z, which is my objective function. And here let's just say that we're going to maximize profit. So this will be total profit. So first, define the decision variables. Step two of the formulation is define the objective. So because I'm dealing with profit, I'm going to be maximizing z. And then I have to have some actual data in order to put the coefficients together. So let's say I make, um, I don't know, four bucks for each soldier I make and sell. And let's say I make three dollars for each toy train I make and sell. So that is linear, right? For each each soldier I sell, I'll make and sell, then I uh, make four bucks. Same thing for each toy train. Then we're going to say subject to the constraints. And I'm going to abbreviate that ST the next time because mathematicians are lazy when it comes to writing things down. So subject to a bunch of constraints. So let's say that we had um, construction material, right, wood, because we're making uh, wooden toys perhaps instead of plastic. Uh, and let's say that it takes, I don't know, one and a half cubic feet of lumber to make a soldier and for a train it takes two cubic feet to make a train and we might only have a hundred cubic feet for lumber and so we have to stay under it so it would be a less than or equal to constraint and this would be and here's where I, I am quite particular I want you to put in braces or parentheses what this constraint represents so this is the lumber Right, constraint. And then we might have labor where it might take two hours to make a soldier and only one hour to make a train and I might have 80 hours available to me. Right. And then I might have some other constraints that go along with it. I'm just making this stuff up so who knows what it's really going to be. And then finally we have non-negativity where we have S and that's a comma t greater than or equal to zero because I cannot make a negative number of toy soldiers. I cannot make a negative number of toy trains. Right. So that has to be non-negative. So that's that's what we were going to talk about for formulation. We will practice quite a few of those in class and you'll get plenty of practice on the homework as well. After we formulate, then we get to solve the problem Right, the one I just did uh, in two variables. Right, I could graph that. Right, this could be s, this could be t on the axis, and I could graph the constraints, find the feasible region, find the corner points, all that fun stuff. Um, we will do a couple of those, but then what happens when you get the three variables? Oh, I can't do that in pictures, you might say. Ah, you can. I am now in three dimensions. I can draw in three dimensions. What about four variables? Uh, I'm not great at drawing in four dimensions. Uh, if you can do it, please show me. I'd be interested. What happens when I get to 1,592 variables? That's when I want software. So we'll look at stuff that stays probably within the limits of what the Excel solvers add in um, handles, which is 200, although I have had examples in class that are much bigger than that. Um, you may be thinking that 1,592 variables is a lot. To me, that is nothing. I work all the time in tens of thousands of variables and tens of thousands of constraints. How do I do that? Do I 
Do I write out each constraint and plug it into a spreadsheet? No. I programmatically write the code to generate each of the constraints and each of um, each of the constraints and then the objective functions and then use the an API application programming interface to feed it into a, a commercial solver and the solver solves the thing for me. Right. So when we start getting big that's when we start using programmatic interfaces. So that is a brief overview of linear programming. I think it's fun I could go on forever about this stuff but I think that's probably good for now uh, and we will see also how to solve the thing in Excel in a little bit as well. Alrighty.